Good afternoon, and welcome to the second webinar in our two-part series on creating schools that are both physically and psychologically safe for students and educators. Uh, we're taking up the question of what can we do to protect children in a world that is becoming ever more unsafe. Uh, children across the country now are having to do drills every year in the event of mass shootings uh, and violence in their schools. Uh, there's also the threat of uh, increased bullying and psychological trauma as students are contending with uh, various kinds of racism, uh, anti-religious um, discrimination, uh, LGBTQI discrimination, uh, and other forms of uh, psychological trauma. Uh, we, in our first webinar, dealt with the research about school safety and what research has found is actually effective. And in the chat, you'll see a link to that webinar, which is available uh, for you to view uh, recorded. Uh, and what we found in the research is that there's actually relatively little uh, in, uh, effect of uh, metal detectors uh, or school resource officers uh, and uh, big increases in safety. Uh, when you have the right kinds of mental health resources, uh, explicit teaching of social emotional learning and skills, personalization for students, uh, and uh, restorative practices. And today we are focusing in on restorative practices, which are grounded in the science of uh, learning and development, which show that students are most likely to uh, demonstrate positive behavior and learn more productively when their school climate and relationships are uh, well uh, designed around community, around feelings of trust, safety, and belonging, uh, when they are enabled to become a, an accountable member of a community, reflecting on their behavior and making amends, uh, and uh, explicit teaching of respect married to uh, being cared for and learning to care for others. Uh, how to do this is a major question. There is hopeful evidence from schools. There is hopeful research on how these practices matter. Uh, and that is what we are taking up in our uh, agenda today. And uh, I now have the uh, pleasure and honor of introducing uh, well, I'm, I'm now going to um, move to our presentation, our moderator, uh, and we hope to be joined shortly by Senator Chris Murphy from the great state of Connecticut. And when, when he joins, we will introduce him properly at that time. So I want to introduce uh, our moderator for today's discussion, Dr. Jerry House, who will introduce our speakers and our panel. Dr. House has been a pioneering educator for many decades. She was district superintendent for 15 years, first in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and then in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, during her tenure in Memphis, she introduced district-wide change and successfully redesigned schools based on the whole child models that we now know foster student success. Her work was actually featured in any number of books, including one by um, Peter Senge, others by Phil Schlechte and Rosabeth Cantor. In 1999, a time when very few women were leading major urban school districts, she was named the uh, AASA National Superintendent of the Year, the Tennessee Superintendent of the Year. Uh, she's won many other major awards. And she later launched and led the Institute for Student Achievement, uh, which enabled amazing transformations of high schools in New York and elsewhere, from low performing schools into academically rigorous and personalized schools that enable students to graduate prepared for success in college and careers. I've been in a number of these schools, uh, one of which was led by one of our panelists, uh, uh, Carolyn Quintana, uh, and documented by LPI. Uh, they are truly remarkable. Jerry has served on many boards, and I'm honored that one of them is the Learning Policy Institute Board. So please help me welcome my dear friend and a great educator, Dr. Jerry House. Thank you, Linda, for that very generous introduction. We now turn to our discussion about what restorative practices are and the conditions under which they can be successful. I want first to introduce Dr. Sarah Cleveland, 
a senior researcher at LPI who will guide us through a presentation of what restorative practices are and why they are so important. And following Sarah will be a presentation by Dr. Sean Darlin Hammond, an assistant professor of community health sciences and biostatistics at the University of California at Los Angeles. And Sean recently completed an extraordinary large scale study on the impacts of restorative practices on student well being and achievement. Sarah, turn it to you. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be grounding our discussion today with an explanation of what restorative practices are, um, but I wanna first address why they're needed. Um, restorative practices are an alternative to punitive disciplinary environments. These are environments that exclude students when their behavior doesn't meet expectations. We know from research that exclusionary discipline like suspensions does not actually make schools safer, um, but instead is associated with negative outcomes for students. Suspensions are known to increase alienation and disengagement, to undermine overall school climate, to reduce academic progress, and to increase dropout rates. Disproportionality of disciplinary outcomes is well documented. This figure comes from a report from some of my colleagues, and it shows suspension rates dating back to the 1970s. You can see from the graph that the United States has had high rates of exclusionary discipline for decades, with rates that are higher for Black students, Native American students, and Latinx students. And research tells us that this is not because these student groups are misbehaving at higher rates, but instead because they are punished more severely than other students for similar behaviors. Because of their known negative effects, efforts are being made to reduce suspensions, and restorative practices are an important alternative to exclusionary disciplinary environments. So what are restorative practices? I like this definition from the Schott Foundation. Restorative approaches proactively build healthy relationships and a sense of community to prevent and address conflict and wrongdoing. wrongdoing. Um, one of the most common misperceptions about restorative practices is that they are primarily used to address conflicts and problems, when actually restorative practices are used much more broadly. They can be used to build a sense of community in schools, to teach interpersonal and communication skills, to proactively meet student needs so that misbehavior is less common, and also to repair harm when, when conflict does occur. One of the restorative justice coordinators that I used to work with in New York City used to say, um, you can't use restorative practices if there isn't already a relationship or community in place to restore, which makes a lot of sense to me. And it means that most of the time, restorative practices should be used to build in-school relationships, to build community, and that occasionally they can be used to repair harm. Many schools implement uh, restorative practices using a tiered system. So the bottom, the bottom part of this triangle, tier one, these are practices that are for all students in, in a variety of school settings. Examples of this might be community building circles or um, opportunities for all students to learn interpersonal and conflict resolution skills. Um, in the middle segment, um, tier two, these are practices that are for smaller groups of circles. Examples are conflict mediation and problem solving circles. And then at the very top of the triangle, this is tier three. These are practices that are um, used to support individual students. Um, an example of this might be a reentry circle. These are circles that are used to welcome students back to the school community after some kind of extended absence. Um, in a recent LPI brief about restorative practices, we describe a reentry circle for a student returning to school after um, after a long period in a juvenile justice center. And you know, we sort of describe the ways that that circle helped him come back to school um, positively and reconnect with his teachers and and um, and peers. Restorative circles are um, a cornerstone practice of uh, restorative of restorative practices. Did I say that backwards? <laughs> restorative circles are a cornerstone practices, are, are a cornerstone restorative practice. So they can be used for lots of different purposes, um, community building to help students connect with academic content and to address conflict. So I had a chance to visit some students at Fremont High School in Oakland, and they told me about um, language circles at their school. 
Um, these are community building circles that are facilitated by students in several different languages. So the purpose is really to give students a chance to connect with one another while um, while speaking their native language. So that's that's one example of a community building circle. Um, circles are typically a structured practice. So you can see in the photo here that students are using a talking piece. In this case, they're using a soccer ball. Um, and students know that when they hold the talking piece, that's their chance to speak. When, they, when they're when they not, that their job is to listen. Uh, and circles are typically facilitated by a trained facilitator. That could be an adult at the school or a student. When circles are used to address harm um, or to repair harm, Facilitators typically draw on a what's called the restorative line of questioning. So that includes questions like, what happened? What were you thinking when this happened? Who was affected by what happened? And what needs to happen to make this situation right? So you can see that embedded in this kind of practice are lots of opportunities to teach students communication and problem solving skills. Um, so now I'm, that is a very brief overview of restorative practices. Um, but and now I'm going to turn the mic to Sean, who's going to talk about their impact on student outcomes. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that wonderful introduction to what restorative practices are and um, how they can be impactful for students and communities. Um, I want to start by giving you a bit of an, uh, an overview of my orientation to this work. I mean, there are a lot of experts out there who are going to talk about restorative practices. Um, it's helpful to know why people have the opinions they do. Um, so. Uh, while earning my JD, I worked as a legal advocate in juvenile courts, and I saw firsthand what happens when students are funneled from cycles of exclusionary discipline into juvenile involvement. And the impacts on my clients, who are primarily students of color, some with special needs, um, on their educational opportunities and on their mental health, were shocking. And I was really hopeful that there was something we could do to intervene upstream of these cycles of exclusion. Um, I was fortunate around the same time to begin working as one of the co-directors for Berkeley High School's restorative justice program. And there I had a front row seat to see the power of the transformative alternative that restorative practices can be. And you can see me there in the picture with hair no less, helping to run a conflict resolution proceeding. Um, we were a diversion program. So we were creating new pathways for students who were on the verge of exclusion. And I saw students who went through our restorative process not only understand the harm they caused and repair that harm and take steps to make sure they didn't make the same mistakes again, but I also saw them develop a better and more nurturing relationship with themselves and with their peers. Um, they often became members of our program to help others in their school community go through our restorative process when mistakes were made. Um, so after seeing the harms of discipline and the power of restorative practices, I worked as an education law attorney for a number of years and started to understand the legislative and regulatory landscapes that determine the school practices that students are being exposed to. Then I earned my PhD in public policy to gain the tools needed to understand the many impacts of exposure to restorative practices on outcomes like racial disparities in discipline, but also school climate and student mental health. So we'll be talking about a lot of that today. Um, last week, I actually attended a really, I think, powerful conference, two-day conference in San Francisco that brought together some of the experts in the restorative practices K-12 space. Um, and we actually had a few restorative circles. Um, so I'm being very invigorated about the topic right now. Um, today, I'm really looking forward to discussing the impacts of these practices with you. Um, but before we do, I want to add to our understanding about not just discipline, but discipline disparities, black-white disparities in discipline. Um, so next slide, please. So this chart is based on the most recent federal data and shows the out of school suspension rates for white and black students in various contexts. White students are in green, black students are in blue. And the lines separate different contexts and subpopulations. So for example, when looking at students across the country generally, about 4% of white students are suspended, but about 12% of black students are suspended. So black students are three times more likely to experience a suspension. But what you'll see in sort of the sawtooth pattern here is that across contexts and subpopulations, Black students are two or more times more likely to, re to receive an out-of-school suspension. And that's true when you look at male students, female students, special education students, poor students, wealthy students, students in traditional schools, magnet schools, charter schools, students in elementary, middle, and high schools, and even students in preschools. Um, we actually have a report coming out that documents the pervasiveness and consistency of these disparities um, relatively soon. Uh, but I think it's important to be aware of them so we can start to think about where these disparities come from. Um, so next slide, please. So I think it's important to remember that what we call discipline is the phenomenon wherein a school 
punishes a student to try to change that student's behavior. So you can actually have discipline without misbehavior, so long as there's some punishment. The only thing that, need, that is needed is a scholastic response to perceived misbehavior. So where do black-white disparities in discipline come from? Are they just reflections of black-white disparities in misbehavior? So Sarah already mentioned before that you know, there's evidence to suggest that that's not the case. And indeed, studies from psychology, sociology, and economics have consistently found that racial disparities in discipline are largely caused by racially inequitable treatment of black and white students. So Jason Okonofu and Jennifer Eberhardt, two of my favorite co-authors, um, did amazing work in this regard in 2015 that was foundational because it showed that even when teachers review the same incident of misbehavior, if they think the misbehaving student is black, they want to punish that student more harshly. So this really is about something happening in how we respond to students. And that means that the intervention point isn't about student behavior. It's about the scholastic response. But I want to take a moment to think about what that inequality of treatment means for Black youth. What do you think they feel when they are, become aware that they're being treated differently and being excluded more often just because they're Black? How does that impact their mental health? And what, do they, what can we do to address this inequity and avoid the attendant harms? Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, we don't need to guess at the harms of racial disparities in discipline. Many, including myself, have actually explored the question and consistently found that for students generally and for Black students in particular, exposure to discipline and discipline disparities not only increases defiance and misbehavior, quite ironically given the goal, but it saps educational opportunities, it creates trajectories of incarceration, it engenders depression and disconnection and even suicidal ideation. So the stakes are pretty high. And the question then becomes, can restorative practices provide a transformational alternative that can be more uh, nurturing and protective? So next slide, please. So if you ask many in Oakland, the answer you're gonna hear is yes. And that's because in Oakland in the 2010s, restorative practices played a huge role in transforming the educational ecosystem experienced by many black youth. So these two quotes come from Darius, and that's a pseudonym to protect their identity. Um, Darius is a former Oakland Unified student who had the, I had the pleasure of interviewing a few years ago. And he explained to me how restorative practices helped him go from being in a state of precarity to being a leader for change in his community. So he remembers the moment when he was expelled from school and dropped out like this. I dropped out of school. Actually, they kicked me out because I didn't want to give them my hat. It was real zero tolerance. I was expelled for defiance, for putting a hat in my backpack instead of giving it to them. And I had had bad experiences since preschool. So it was easy for me to be like, forget this. As a teenager, I was thinking, you don't care about us anyway. You just get paid checks for a student in a seat. So after dropping out, Darius spent time in a gang and eventually he was arrested. And he was given two choices. He'd either go to jail or go back to school at a school called Ralph Bunch Academy a school that just so happened to be one of the earliest adopters of restorative practices in the US. So he chose school and he was skeptical, understandably given his experiences since preschool with cyclical exclusion. Everything changed though after he started attending circles at Ralph Bunch. So he said, it was the first time in my life I ever wanted to be at school. Like we got circle today, I gotta go. I wanted to be in class, do projects, interact, be one of the first students called on. I felt good being up here. Without restorative practices, I'd probably be dead or in jail too. And the quote continues, after I graduated, I realized I could bring this to homies to change my community. I was like, this is what I want to do. I had already lost four friends to the justice system, four sentenced to 10 to 15 years under the age of 20. I had seen four murdered in the same year. I wanted to save my friends' lives. So I think what we can see here is not only how powerful the stakes are, but also how powerful the transformative potential is. But we can't set policy based on the experience of one person. So the question that I have that has taken up a lot of my life for the last half decade is can we determine if restorative practices really work for students broadly, for black students to reduce racial disparities and to transform school environments? Um, and fortunately, um, well, I should say the first thing we need to do to understand it, um, if restorative practices can have the impacts we hope to see is to figure out which students in schools are gaining exposure to these practices. And fortunately, we can glean clues from the California Healthy Kids Survey. The survey covers hundreds of thousands of California middle school students, and we can use the data to understand levels of exposure to restorative practices using an eight item scale, which touches on the extent to which they are seeing three things in their schools. I'm not gonna say all eight of the things in the scale, I'll just touch on the three sort of major sub points. 
One is whether they're experiencing relational repair practices that guide students to reconnect after there has been some harm. That's kind of like what Sarah was mentioning in the tier two practices. Another is community building practices that give students the tools they need to deepen community bonds. You can think of that as sort of like tier one stuff. And then the next is broad, the, the extent to which this broad implementation, so students of all backgrounds benefit. So that's kind of getting at whether this tier one and tier two stuff is being experienced by students of all backgrounds, not just certain students. And you'll see why that matters a little later. Um, so what do we find when we look at these measures? Do we see that students who have more exposure to restorative practices actually fare better? Um, next slide, please. So our model suggests strongly that they do. Specifically, students who have more exposure to restorative practices are much less likely to be exposed to discipline. This is true for all students, for black students, for white students, for Asian students and Hispanic students. But you may recall that I spoke earlier about the harms of discipline disparities of black students experiencing more discipline than white students and knowing that it's their race that drives this inequity. Well, it turns out that students who have more exposure to restorative practices also do not exhibit racial disparities in discipline. We can see that in this chart because what we're looking at in the, uh, the sort of light blue is a black discipline rate. Um, or the number of days suspended. It's the same whether we look at the discipline or the days suspended. And you can see that as we get towards more sort of practices to the right, that discipline experience is getting lower and lower, right? And similarly, when we sort of compare that to the red, which is white, we see that it crosses, meaning that at the highest levels of exposure, we don't have a discipline gap anymore. Um, imagine what that means for the black students in terms of their relationship with themselves, with their peers, and with their school, and for their mental health and well-being. But the potential benefits don't stop at discipline. Um, so next slide, please. We also found that for students of all backgrounds, more exposure to restorative practices was also related to better performance on standardized tests of English language arts and math, and that more exposure actually meant smaller racial disparities in academic achievement. Um, but there are a lot of other outcomes that can help us understand students' experiences beyond disciplinary and academic outcomes. Students in schools are not merely getting grades at avoiding suspensions. So what do we find when we track what happens in schools that increase their utilization of restorative practices over time? Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. We see that these schools saw incredible benefits across a range of outcomes. They saw significant declines in victimization, misbehavior, depressive symptoms, gang membership, substance use rates, sleep deprivation rates, physical illness rates, and significant improvements in GPA and school climate. Now, you may be wondering why increasing the exposure to restorative practices or the utilization of these practices might be related to these health outcomes. So this is me speaking as a scholar of health and education. When students experience less stress, when they feel more connection, they're their systems are actually able to adapt to their scenario a lot better. Their Im immune systems function better. They find themselves able to sleep better because they're not dealing with high levels of cortisol and they're able to secrete the hormones that allow for sleep and rest much more easily. And that results in less sleep deprivation, less illness, and definitely less depressive symptoms. So to me, I'm not surprised to see this, but I know that for many who aren't in this sort of health and ed space, this may seem a little bit strange. Um, but it's not just a matter of what happens when schools become more restorative. There's also the question of what happens when schools abandon these practices. Um, uh, and what we find is that schools that evidenced abandonment of restorative practices saw significant and marked declines in school climate and many other measures. This is a critical finding, particularly in this moment where many schools are shifting back towards punitive practices. You know, our model suggests that this retrenchment towards the punitive and the exclusionary is as harmful as progress towards restorative practices is beneficial. And for me, thinking of the students that I once worked with in juvenile courts, it's hardly surprising. Punitive environments are incredibly stressful. They can feel dehumanizing and essentializing. They can sap one's sense of connection and they can cause harm. So how can we implement restorative practices in a manner that ensures sustained and stable growth towards creating a restorative climate? Next slide, please. Keith Hickman, who is one of the leaders of the International Institute of Restorative Practices, provided some insight when I chatted with him a few years ago. He said, it has to happen across the whole school. All the adults in the building have a responsibility to have a relationship with children and build the culture. 
Restorative practices are not just one person's responsibility. Success requires staff commitment across all levels. You need continuous meetings and professional development days. You know, to shift the culture of the school, the work has to be everybody's work. It has to be to become part of who everybody is in the school. It has to be core to everything they do. And that is no small feat. But the benefits, according to our models, of making this transition are incredibly potent. And the risks, according to our models, of not making this transition are incredibly severe. Um, and with that, it's my pleasure to pass things off to Dr. Jerry House to lead our panel discussion. Thank you, um, Sean and Sarah, for your very informative and relevant presentations to help set the stage for our discussion today. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished panelist, um, I, we just got an announcement that Senator Murphy was unexpectedly called to the Senate floor and won't be able to join us today, and he sends his regrets. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the distinguished panelist, Tatiana Chatterjee is the Restorative Justice Facilitator at Fremont High School in the Oakland, California United School District, Unified School District. And she's also a contributing author to the Little Book of Youth Engagement in Restorative Justice, Intergenerational Partnerships for Just and Equitable Schools. Over the past decade, Tatiana has innovated methods for strong tier one implementation towards positive and nurturing school communities. Outside of the classroom, she serves as a trainer, educator, and peace builder addressing systemic oppression, youth empowerment, and alternatives to the criminalization of harm and wrongdoing. She's been recognized for her work in participatory performance with people in and outside of prison. Pedro Nogueira is one of the nation's leading scholars on issues related to race, inequality, and education. Prior to serving as the Dean of the Rossier School of Education at the University of Southern California, Pedro was a professor of education and holder of endowed chairs at UCLA, NYU, Harvard University, and the University of California, Berkeley. He has served as an advisor to the governor of New Mexico in education policy and worked as an advisor to the state departments of education in Washington, Oregon, New York, and Rhode Island, as well as with several large urban school districts throughout the country. In 2022, Pedro was appointed to President Biden's National Commission on Hispanics, and he, is, and he was asked to serve as the co-chair of the state of California's Black Student Achievement Task Force by the state superintendent. Carolyn Quintana serves as the Deputy Chancellor of Teaching and Learning for New York City public schools. As deputy chancellor, Carolyn is dedicated to holistically reimagining how New York City students learn, which is a top priority. Previously, she held the position of senior director of social, emotional, and academic development at the Institute, of Stu Institute for Student Achievement. In that role, she focused on developing practices, resources, and systems to support students' success. Carolyn's career in public education began as a ninth grade ELA teacher in Bronx, New York. She then became a district literacy coordinator for the White Plains New York City School District and later led the rebuilding efforts of Bronxdale High School in the Bronx. Following that, Carolyn worked as a new principal support coach, providing guidance to new school leaders across New York City. And we also welcome Sean Darling Hammond back to the panel discussion. So I think you would agree that we have a very experienced and distinguished list of group of panelists with us today. 
And I'd like to begin, Carolyn and Tatiana, the discussion with the two of you. Uh, you both have experience implementing restorative practices in your school communities. And both um, Sarah and Sean have given us some glimpse of what happens in schools that implement restorative practices. So I don't wanna take that further and have you give us some more pictures of what those practices, what those practices look like in action. You know, if we were to visit your schools, what are we likely to see and hear? And then as the second part of that question, we know that implementing restorative practices is not an off the shelf quick fix program. So in your work, what have you identified as the necessary conditions that schools need to put in place to successfully implement effective restorative practices? So why don't we begin with you, Carolyn? Thank you, Jerry, appreciate it. Um, so I, I think there's a, a combined answer in there. Um, and I, I love that Sarah started with having to have a community that we care about. There need to be those feelings of trust and safety and belonging. Um, and we know that those lead to strong academic mindsets as well. And so part of that is that a school has to have a leader that has committed to creating that kind of an environment in their system. And that means clear and consistent messaging, um, time for adults to meet where they get to have explicit teaching and opportunities to work with one another, classrooms where we have made it okay uh, to make mistakes and learn so that young people already have a sense of what that means in my math classroom, in my ELA classroom, so that when it comes to doing that for other purposes, um, that you already have that established as part of the way that things work. When, when I first started building out these practices more officially, right, we had been doing a lot of this before it had some of these names, and when we started building out more officially, I made it a point to always show my teachers what it is that I wanted to see. So we visited other schools that were doing this well. Um, we asked folks, uh, you know, fortunately, we, you've got somebody here, Tatiana, in just a moment, he'll be talking to you about what happened in Oakland. Oakland was working on this work well before we were in New York. And so I could ask for videos from Oakland to be able to show um, what these practices look like. And I made sure that I was trained as well so I could model and, and have language to talk about this work. Um, we started with early adopters and making sure that there was plenty, plenty of training for that. And then the very specific pieces were about making decisions about the purpose behind each rule that already existed in our school. So Sean mentioned hats. What did hats do to take away from the way that a student might learn in our school? And it turns out that they, they didn't have an impact. And in fact, that hats were part of what clothing kids wore. The funny thing is, um, and, and folks who came to visit noted it, when we stopped policing essentially whether or not students were wearing hats, they weren't a problem anymore. They simply weren't an issue. And so there wasn't uh, the need for kids to end up in some sort of punitive disciplinary place. We also made it a point to have fun. We had community meals, field days, staff or students events. We even did things like fairs for the community where our students created different rooms for different age groups to go through. And we structured things like community service days that were built into the school year. We also made it a point to move clubs from the end of the day to during the day so that every child could have an opportunity to be part of a community. And then really specifically, you heard Sean talk a little bit about community courts. We actually started youth courts with um, specific parent responsibilities, staff responsibilities, and peer participants who at some point actually became trainers. I think Tatiana will probably talk to you a little bit more about some of the practices specifically, and you'll hear about um, some of the things that happen in classrooms. I think one thing that's important is when we had those practices, let's say, for example, apology letters. We didn't just say that's something that we want to do because we read about it in a book. A student actually offered to give an apology to a custodian when they had gone into the, um, the auditorium and had actually tossed a trash can around. And instead of saying, well, we're just going to do a, a random apology letter, he actually had offered to do that as part of, of what he wanted to do to repair the harm person to person 
And instead of doing things like we had received some feedback, you know, you can just give them tasks to do, like papering the bulletin boards. Well, that's not connected to the community or to the person that they had harmed. And so we had the kids actually provide us with suggestions for what to do. So in this particular case, the children, the young people offered to go into the lunchroom and let freshmen know about respect and about cleaning up and walked around to each table and reminded them for a whole week they had offered to do that to, for the custodian as a personal way of showing that they understood, one, what they had done, but two, what it meant. And so I think that it's those pieces, right? It's not a matter of saying, check, we do this thing, check, we do this thing. But what does it mean very um, specifically when we talk about person to person? Tatiana, yeah, yep. Great. Hi, Tatiana. everyone. Thanks so much um, for this conversation. You asked Jerry about the what's happening, right? What are some of the practices? What do they look like? And I think um, one thing I want to uplift is the uh, the work of students who maybe are are drawn to leadership, who want to facilitate, who think of themselves as peace builders, that uh, here at my school in East Oakland, we do that. We have a group of students that are able to self-regulate and model how to be in community. And we also pair that with a tier one approach where everybody, regardless of, of anything other uh, difficult difficulty in their background, when they come to Fremont, they have the experience of learning how to listen, of being in an intense space where they are asked to be their best selves and then we slowly chip away at all the ways that we are not um, able to be to humanize other people and to empathize right we have to teach empathy very slowly and carefully with that attention to the fact that people dealing with intense trauma the trauma of poverty violence in the community and in their lives are not going to automatically be able to uh to even want to talk to somebody else that they don't already know. So uh, the conditions for allowing a school to move forward on restorative practices and uh, sort of peace, it's we we need to have the commitment and the acknowledgement that it's not easy, that there's no formula, that there's uh, we're making the road as we walk it. And that uh, similar to what Carolyn and others have said around leaders, there has to be that vision that this is what we want to do, that people in our community need to be humanized and treated with dignity. And it's not going to be perfect. I walk in the hallway. I Earlier today, I had to uh, break up a fight. People are angry. They're carrying not just their own personal stories, but their family stories, cultural stories, and experiences of oppression. How do we hold them with love and and remind them that back in the day, maybe they know they knew what it was to actually listen, to de-escalate, and to connect with someone else. So it's the kind of constant eyes on um, on the various <laughs> hot points, right? That are that break up a community, and then. Uh, ongoing training and exploration uh, involving parents in addition to student leaders so that there's um, more buy-in. We talk a lot about teacher buy-in and making sure that the teachers feel supported. Uh, in RJ, you sometimes will see a student advocacy uh, focus disproportionate to working alongside adults. And I'll just say that everyone is part of this picture and we need to include and welcome and extend our hands to the educators who are really caretakers for our young people in saying that this is for you too. This is for all of us. Um, yeah, I'll pause there. I could talk for days. So Thank you. I want to add just one piece to that. I know this wasn't one of my questions, but I just came back, as I mentioned, from this two-day conference on restorative practices. And one of the papers that was presented was a summary of uh, insights from facilitators and coordinators of restorative programs around the country. And one of the things they consistently said was, if you want the entire school to feel like this is something they're bought into and create that political will, then administrators, which is to say superintendents, principals, those at the top, have to show up to restorative convenings, to restorative interactions, so that they're signaling that this isn't just something that they wrote down and are expecting someone else to do, but they're actually invested in this. They are part of this culture transition. And that really resonated with me because what a difference from how we think about the hierarchical ordering of our school societies and what the role of an administrator is and what a difference that would make for a student to see their principal sitting shoulder to shoulder with them, thinking about how to grow their community. So. 
So, so are we talking about school transformations similar to what you did at Bronxdale, um, Carolyn, which takes a longer period of time, or is it possible to implement restorative practices without the long-term holistic school transformation that uh, some schools pursue and some folks think that you have to have that in order for restorative practices to take hold. Sean, maybe since you, why don't we throw that question to you first? Because you talk about the this, this principals and teachers and all needing to be involved. Um, how do you get there? Schools have <laughs> the academics, they have the mental health issues that they are dealing with. So where what's the starting point? Well, I think the starting point is to accept that it takes time. Right. So uh, there is this thing called a restorative readiness scale. Um, researchers utilize it all the time to get a sense of whether a school is ready culturally to make the transition towards becoming a restorative environment. And one of the core aspects of that scale is the commitment to shifting from punitive and carceral logics to restorative logics, which takes time. Teachers will have internalized, as we all have, that punishment controls behavior. Like I'm a parent. That's something that I have to untrain myself of all the time. And I think we all have to untrain ourselves to realize relationships create connection. And connection is what actually fosters the sense that I care about and want to invest in my community and creates the behavioral outcomes that we want, but also the sort of mental health outcomes. So it's investing in that long-term cultural and even psychological transition that it's not going to happen overnight. And it's really working with teachers working with in teachers. professional learning communities and coaching postures to help them make that transition because it's not going to happen overnight. And there will be a lot of temptation to go back to old habits. If you've taught a certain way for 10 years and now suddenly someone's saying, when a student misbehaves, do this, not that, your instincts are going to be misaligned with this new expectation. It takes time. It takes support. It takes encouragement. And it takes real coaching and training. Pedro, I want you to join in on this discussion. In spite of the research and the positive outcomes of restorative practices, there's still a lot of concerns being expressed about the focus on restorative practices, that it's too soft on discipline, that it doesn't necessarily hold students accountable for their actions, especially when those actions cause harm or, they disrupt, or it disrupts other students' ability to learn. And they argue that with this increasing with the increasing episodes of school violence, that schools need more metal detectors, more armed security, and more school resource officers. Um, nearly two thirds of secondary schools in the US today report employing a school resource officer. Now you've worn many hats in education, advising state and district leaders. So what would you tell these leaders and parents specifically about the use of school resource offices, since two thirds of the schools already have them and others are thinking about them. And what is the role of SROs in school safety? Is it a good return on schools investment? Jerry, great to see you. And I'm glad to be part of this discussion. Uh, I've, I've been uh, writing in the chat throughout because I've been, um, you know, hearing things I wanted to respond to. So let me start by saying that it's essential for schools to be safe places. That it's essential for them to be orderly places. No one can learn in an unsafe or disorderly environment. A friend of mine was killed in Oakland last year, a member of the staff by outsiders who came to the school and shot at, at people. So this is not a small matter. And, and we should not pretend that in a, in a community that has a problem with violence, that you can get rid of security guards. You can't, you, that would be irresponsible to the, the, mem the members of that, the, the children and to the staff. At the same time, I think that it's important to realize what role do secure, uh, those SROs play? They should be there to support teachers in helping to maintain a safe and orderly environment. And when I worked with in Oakland several years ago, uh, one of the schools I worked with in West Oakland decided to hire a 63-year-old grandmother as a SRO. And it worked perfectly because she had something that most SROs don't have, which is moral authority. She had the relationships with the community that are essential 
to maintaining a safe environment. And that's why it's important that we not just think of restorative justice as a new kind of discipline. It's about a, a culture shift, about creating an environment where people know each other, trust each other, work together. There absolutely must be consequences for misbehavior. If there are no consequences, you're gonna get more disorder, right? The question is, are the consequences meaningful? The punishment for not doing your work should be more work, not less work. Getting sent home to play video games is not an effective form of discipline for most kids. So if you simply tell principals, lower the suspension rate, then what happens? They'll say, okay, I'll let the kids run wild in the school. If you say to the principal, you've got to be more creative on how you address discipline infractions when they occur, then they have to think like a parent. John, you tell your kids if they act up, get out of the house for three days and don't come back? Or do you say, you're not going to get to watch TV? You're not going to uh, get some of the things you like? You take away privileges. This is common sense. But in a lot of schools, that, that that's not that's lacking. So let me just tell one story from New York now about hats, which came up earlier. This is a school I visited in Queens. Beautiful school. And um, walking through the hall with the assistant principal, and I see a student wearing a hat. I said, you allow students to wear hats? He said, sometimes. Huh. And he called the student over. He says, explain why you're wearing the hat. And the student rolled his eyes. He said, that was going to take a while. He said, take, t explain. He said, well, we had a town hall meeting because kids were wearing hats and it would become a source of friction. And, um, and, and a group of Muslim girls said they should have the right to wear headscarves because it's their religion. And we took a vote and everyone voted that they should be able to wear their headscarves. And then the, the kids who were hip hop kids said, well, we should be able to wear hats. And we took a vote and there was no agreement. So a group of teachers and students met together and said, you can earn the right to wear a hat. Never in class, but only in the hall. To wear the hat, you have to have be a, a be on better on your on your GPA, and you have to have good attendance. Without that, see, so when you see a kid wearing a hat, it means that they have demonstrated that they can a responsible member of the community. The point of the story is that you need buy-in from the community. If you don't get buy-in from the kids, from the teachers, it's not going to work. Buy-in creates an environment where the relationships are strong and where the kids will tell you if there's a problem brewing and warn you, there'll be a fight after school today. Sean, did you have a response to, or want to add on to what Pedro just talked about? No, I completely agree with that notion that I wouldn't send my kid out of the home for three days. Uh, sure. No, I think it, it, it's all, it, it makes sense that there are these sort of commonsensical things that we forget about when we get in the business of controlling young people rather than enriching them or thinking of them as one of our own. Um, and when we get back to that sense of what would I do if it were my kid, how would I try to nurture them in this situation? The answer often isn't to push them out. Yep. I also, Jerry, I, I, wanted, I saw you. Yeah, I yeah. saw you. Yeah. I wanted to add, so two things. One is Pedro, I, I appreciate that that particular example um, was built by the community for that specific community, right? And it's different from the examples that we've already shared before. And so that that's what's really important, right? Is that you're thinking about what that community believes in, wants, and, and can do. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention though, Jerry, is I've seen a number of schools where, uh, you know, they're not making decisions about, do I need a school safety agent or not? They're making decisions about what role do these folks play? How do I incorporate them into the training? How do I take them to see what restorative looks like? How are they part of, because many of our, our agents are actually members of the local community, they know and they understand, they know our families, they're often neighbors, right? And so it's really, really helpful if they too have been trained and understand what it means to know students well and to um, think about uh, creating safe and caring and welcoming communities in this way. And so I think really important, again, Pedro, that you said not to get rid of them entirely. In some spaces, there may be a need for them um, for whatever reason, whether it's a perception piece or or because there are actually have been large number of weapons that, that have been found, um, but to make sure that wherever we have agents in place, that they are a part of the community and understand what it means to be restorative too. Sean, the research uh, 
regarding the high percentages of black students and students from low income families and students uh, with disabilities having less exposure to restorative practices is, you know, qu quite disturbing. Um, you know, what proactive measures can schools begin to take to ensure that there is that restorative practices are available to all students in an equitable manner? Um, so I'll take a second to shout out the report, which is where you'll find those results. Um, so I, I didn't cover everything that's in the very, very long report, but one of the things that we looked at was who has access to restorative practices. And in a follow-up piece that I'm writing now, I look at within schools, who has access to restorative practices. And consistently what I'm finding is the black of the school, the less restorative practices they get exposure to. And even when you look within a school, white students have more exposure to these practices than black students. So what does that mean? Um, and what can we do? Um, so I think the first thing, if we really want to create a change and also to reassure parents, you know, and reassure community members that their children, no matter how they look, will be treated with respect and dignity and have opportunities for the enrichment that comes from these practices is to build trust through honesty and change. So the first step is really honesty. Districts and schools need to look at which students are gaining exposure to these practices and which are not and why. My work shows, as I mentioned, that there are these disparities within districts between schools and within schools between students. Um, but then once you've taken that hard look, the next step is change. We need to make sure that teachers who reach all kinds of students are receiving training and coaching in these practices. And we need to make sure that teachers are using these practices when interacting with students of all backgrounds. You know, that's probably partially a matter of combining restorative practices with cultural sensitivity training and bias training and things that allow teachers to look at students of all backgrounds as individuals, not amalgams of stereotypes. I mean, it requires taking a hard look at why we treat some students differently. These racial disparities in discipline don't emerge from nothing. They emerge from biases, unfortunately. And when we start to attend to that seriously and think we want to create a, a place where, you know, as Pedro put it, everyone feels safe and it's orderly for all, when we create that environment, when, when we're serious about that, that also means being aware of why we treat certain students differently. And when you combine that with sorts of practices, I think the sky's the limit. Okay, let me, let me um, just take a slightly different take than Sean provided there. And again, I'll bring up New York City. So I was at a, a hearing several years ago in New York, and we took the schools that had the highest suspension rates, and we brought the principals in before uh, a hearing before the city council. And the question was, one of them was Boys and Girls High School in Brooklyn, which I'm sure Carolyn knows. The question was, why do you have such high suspension rates? And this is a predominantly black school. And you know what the principal said? He says, I have high suspension rates because I lack other tools. If you gave me counselors, if you gave me social workers, I could respond to the needs of kids differently. His school at the time had more incarcerated kids, or at least formerly incarcerated kids, more homeless kids than any other school. What we have to be acknowledging here is that when schools don't have resources to address the non-academic needs of kids, their, their, their psychological and emotional needs, the needs the kids have for mentoring and support, then what ends up happening is kids act out, they're angry about what's happening in their lives or with their peers, and then schools rely on what they've always done, punish the student, kick them out. If you want schools to respond differently, they need resources to address the root cause of what's behind the behavior problem. And that's what we're not doing in school. We focus on the behavior not the cause of the behavior problem. And when you do that, the problem doesn't go away. It sometimes gets worse. It's so interesting hearing um, sh that piece of your report and your research, Sean, that white students are getting more exposure. I work in a school with, with hardly any white students, right? And this is the se the reality of segregation and racial capitalism. And you, in order to have these schools where people are having all of the resources available to them, you also have to have a school like mine, which is uh, begging for crumbs, you know, in terms of our systemic inequities. And, uh, and I think it also goes to sort of what are the what is the implicit bias or our own ways of treating children and how they misbehave and the normalization of a of a of a carceral response a punitive response to poor kids traumatized kids kids that are um, just grappling with a lot just want to add that and it's interesting you know in Oakland where we are also seen as this model there's a lot of research that's been done here and so how dare that be true that we are you know initiating this stuff and then it's being taken and not being given back. I mean, this is a real, um, a real problem. And I appreciate the spotlight here to just sort of say that also 
folks are struggling here in Oakland, you know, and, and elsewhere that, you know, we, 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 we made the effort. There was, I was part of a community, a parent led um, uh, initiative to, to force the schools to do something different. And look, we're in the news and we're not also uh, given enough to do, to really and adequately respond in a restorative way. We need to not just change the conditions in our schools, but in our neighborhoods, because what happens in the neighborhood bleeds into the schools and it goes, you know, in and out of the gates. And the security officers, we call them now culture keepers, which I think is a great rhetorical shift. But those are our, our community members who oftentimes went to the schools in Oakland, into the very schools where they're protecting. So how do we, you know, actively work with them and our neighbors to 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 create safety? So it takes us to the question of um, what recommendations do you have? We talk a lot about what the schools have to do, but what about policymakers? Pedro brought up the question of lack of resources. Uh, you've mentioned the engagement of the community. So what recommendations do you have for policymakers, uh, for more for practitioners, for the community to be involved? And we can start with any one of you who wants to well, talk I'll about those say areas. I, you know, I spoke about the um, the funding, you know, it, we're, we're, we're vulnerable to budget cuts and to politicians and other sort of, you know, the whims and the fads and the trends. I come from a, a, a generation, I mean, I'm not, you know, where we call it RJ and people are now calling it RP, restorative practices. But what are these various acronyms? And we all know what I'm talking about in education. So how can we be creative, document our work, get those testimonials and do, I mean, you know, I talk uh, a lot of shade about capitalism, but be an entrepreneur for restorative justice, right? Like if our state agents aren't going to secure the funds to have a consistent facilitator or other staffing to make sure it all happens, how do we look elsewhere and be creative? Here in the Bay Area, we have the tech industry. Folks like to talk a lot about, um, about, about Oakland kids or about any of our kids. How do we, uh, you know, sort of reflect the mirror back and, and demand what we're owed? <laughs> speaking about a lot of different things here, but, you know, at a fundamental point, uh, feeling that we are entitled to, to, to more than what we are getting and how creative can we get in, um, in just accessing those funds and shifting the, the paradigms. Yep, that's a, that's absolutely right, Tatiana. And I think that there are ways for schools to think about, you know, if, if you're not going to be provided something, then then how do you create it from within, but you still need the resources. And, and you know, in, in certain communities, you need more resources that are in the form of human beings or manpower than you do in the form of technical pieces like curriculum and things like, well, you need those too, but, uh, you know, the, the, the support that needs to happen in the form of um, practitioners. The, the one thing I will say uh, is when in systems where there isn't that kind of buy-in, where the system as a whole has decided that they don't believe in the work. So that I think that there are two things that need to happen. And one is how do we um, amplify the research, the, the outcomes, um, the benefits of it, uh, so that you can actually show the transformation of schools that has happened when you implement um, this, because it's a mindset, it's an approach, it's not a it's not, as you mentioned, Jerry, something that you buy off the shelf, but Tatiana, it's also not either RJ or RP. It, it is a whole school thing. And you may start with small things, but you have to have it throughout and people have to believe in working in these ways and building relationships in these ways. So there needs to be, I think, Sean, like amplifying the report and so much more about why this matters so that the people making decisions about funding and policy actually can see it and pay attention to it. And then the other part that is the entrepreneurial part from an educator perspective is also to attach it to the big initiatives that people are paying attention to. So if we're paying attention to pieces like right now, we're paying attention to technology, AI, and all of those things, right? In what way do you connect this to what it means to be in spaces where you have to be discerning, where you have to be, um, you know, you have to connect with other people, right? In what way do we connect it to literacy initiatives? In what way do we connect it to, um, you know, I mentioned in the chat earlier that my students who were not my top students who participated in any of these roles became some of my best askers of questions and deliverers of speeches and supporters of others. And so how do you help ensure that wherever you can, you're attaching it to how you help kids become more career and college ready 
um, in addition to the part that we know and believe in that is, this is how kids learn best. This is how people work best. This is how you create longevity for staff um, and, and you create uh, healthy whole spaces for students. I think we have to find the other entry points too. Yeah, here's a question from oh. one of Sorry, go, Jerry, go ahead Sorry, if you no, want. You I, I was going to just add one thing to, um, to what Tatiana and Carol were saying. Um, Tatiana, I think what you mentioned about the sort of pernicious pendulum of politics and how we get away from that and the alluring pool of panaceas is really important for policymakers to attend to. You know, typically when we see funding for these kinds of uh, school responses, the idea is we'll give it a year and see if it works. If we don't see discipline disparities go down or if we see any, you know, down creep in academic achievement, we'll abandon it. We'll try something else. And the reality is culture change takes time. You know, one of the uh, the things that folks in our sort of circle of restorative uh, researchers and, and practitioners talk about a lot is how it can take as many as five years to really see a cultural root, uh, a cultural change take root and, and bear fruit. And if you haven't gotten the political will, the sustained funding, the commitment to keeping going with the journey, even when it's hard, which is going to be, it's culture change, right? Then you're going to have abandonment, which as I mentioned in my report, can be incredibly harmful. You know, imagine being a black student and one year suddenly you're being humanized, there's this big restorative transition, and the next year it's it's a SROs that are just on you for every misbehavior you do because there's been this shift away towards a new punitive approach. Imagine the cognitive harm, the mental harm that that exerts. So if we really want to do this right, we have to be willing to take the time to do it all the way. Okay, any other comments about that question? One of the, um, one of our participants said that, um, asked the question, can someone speak to the role of support staff, custodians, bus drivers, janitorial staff? Yeah, well, I'm in, um, I'm a classified staff, right? Restorative justice facilitator is what we call it here. And uh, some of my colleagues are hourly. So the custodial staff and the lunch, you know, the cafeteria workers are hourly. And where I see that get in the way is having them participate in, uh, in trainings around circle keeping. So teachers often get trainings in circle keeping, and we haven't consistently been able to bring in classified staff, including those culture keepers, the, you know, the security staff, or even case managers to be there. Um, and those folks, as we all know, are oftentimes the, the people that students go to when they are uh, upset, they need some emotional support, or they also, they're just around, they're in our community. And I, I think however a school leader can budget it or make it happen to have more of an inclusive training space so that a training is not just teachers, teachers absolutely, of course, and who are the, the, the who, this wealth of other adults uh, caring adults on campus, almost like deputizing them into this other role, which I think they would, well, you know, put it in their job description, make sure that they're getting compensated, but, you know, to be able to just uh, empower folks to be more connected. I think that buy-in would happen, would kind of flow a little more automatically too. Well, thank you to all of our panelists for um, their comments for their presentations with Sean and Sarah. Um, this is our second webinar in a two-part series on creating schools that are both physically and psychologically safe for students and educators. You can learn more by watching the first webinar in the series, which Linda spoke about, and there's a link in the chat. Um, this webinar recording, the one today, the PowerPoint, and the resources will be available on the LPI website. So I want to thank again our panelists and thank all of you for joining us today.